put together a message to Joe Allen that she's going to send out to all the religious schools to highlight like the Saturday uh, noon leg. It's going to be like a family yeah, thing. We're going to touch a truck and stuff like that. It sounds like it's going to be like Meredith. We're going to start. Yeah. I can't hear. I'm sorry. I know. So I was like, <laughs> we do want to yell too loud. Make sure we're ready to go. We can uh, reconvene our meeting to open session. The board has been in executive session since six o'clock to discuss an employee discipline matter, a student discipline matter, and a contractual issue. If we could stand for the pledge of allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Introductions. Dave Hurst. Yes. Catherine Addo. Robert Tejan. Jody Monroe. Holly Dellenbaugh. Christine Beck. John Walston. Meredith Moriarty. John McPhillips. And Willow Bear is unable to be with us tonight. Uh, first is our approval of minutes. It is recommended um, by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the minutes from the March 15th, 2023 regular board meeting. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Um, and I forgot to mention before we move forward, if we have any pig students with us tonight, um, you're welcome. Um, and your obligation is to stay until the meeting is over or nine o'clock, whichever one comes first. And before you leave, make sure you sign out on one of the sign out sheets that are up here at the board table um, to make sure you get credit for being here. Uh, next are our meeting reports and first up is our superintendent's report. Sure, thank you. Uh, I know we do have a lot of winter athletes here tonight, but before I turn it over to Mr. Keys to recognize them, I'd like to just make a few announcements. I'd like to uh, recognize four teams at the middle school who competed in the regional Odyssey of the Mind tournament on Sunday, March 5th. Odyssey of the Mind, if you're not familiar with it, is known as the world's greatest problem solving program for students. Three teams took first place in their divisions and will move on to the state tournament in Syracuse on April 15th. And one, took, uh, one team took second place in a very close competition. I'd like to congratulate all the teams and best of luck to those headed to Syracuse for the state competition. I'd also like to congratulate our transportation director, Karim Johnson, who's being recognized by the nation's most prominent school transportation publication, School Bus Fleet, as a National School Bus Fleet Administrator of the Year. It's a title bestowed on an individual who is a national role model for success in pupil transportation. So congratulations to Karim. Also a quick bond project update. Um, we did receive bids and they came in as expected over the estimated amounts. Uh, so at the April 19th Board of Ed meeting, um, our director of facilities, architects and project managers will be in attendance to present options uh, for the board to consider as we move forward with a project. Um, finally, before we turn it over to Len to introduce our successful winter athletes, um, Dave Hurst was gonna follow up quickly on um, some comments we received at our last meeting about the yonder pouches. So Dave, okay. do you wanna? Thank you, sure. So I'd like to um, just take this opportunity to respond to some concerns um, regarding the endorsement of and affiliation between yonder pouches and Dave Chappelle. Um, so since its inception in 2014, Yonder has worked with various clients across a broad range of beliefs, identities, and backgrounds within the entertainment industry and beyond. Yonder has been widely adopted by schools, concert venues, wedding venues, and even courtrooms. It's important to note that as a district, we evaluate products based on their effectiveness and usefulness. Um, individuals who use the Yonder pouches in other venues are not relevant to the use of Yonder pouches in schools. Um, in a similar fashion, um, when we make uniform purchasing decisions for athletes, um, we don't do it based on who endorses or um, uses such products from brands such as Nike, Adidas, or Under Armour. Or in our performing arts program, we have a Bose sound system in the auditorium, we use Shure microphones, and we did not make those decisions based on who uses those products. So ultimately, the decision to adopt and use Yonder pouches in our high school was based on their effectiveness in achieving the desired outcomes such as increasing student engagement and overall student mental health. We have fully evaluated the evidence on the benefits and drawbacks of using Yonder pouches, and we made an informed decision based on their specific needs and priorities. Thanks. 
save. Okay. Um, so at this time, uh, we'd like to take a moment to congratulate our uh, winter athletes. And oh, Mr. Key's sitting over there. He's going to come up and uh, introduce them and share their success stories for this year. Absolutely. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, historical winter season for our athletic programs. Uh, we had a tremendous amount of success on the fields of play, but before that, um, well known here at Bethlehem, um, they are student athletes, top flight students, so I do want to recognize we had four scholar athlete programs uh, this winter. Uh, teams carried an average of over 90 and they were distinguished by the um, New York State Public High School Athletic Association. So our boys basketball, our girls basketball, our gymnastics, and our girls indoor track and field programs were all scholar athletes. So congratulations. <laughs> That being said, I'd like to recognize our first group. Uh, he's unable to attend this evening, but our junior, Quincy Bonville, uh, is the first Bethlehem wrestler to qualify for states in 25 years. He had a season record of 44 and six, placed in the top eight. And uh, he's actually currently at a practice for a national tournament in Virginia Beach he's getting ready for. So I want to congratulate Quincy. Congratulations. We had outstanding swimmers this season. Uh, our coach, Tom Carney. Um, gentlemen, when you hear your name, come on up. First, I'd like to call up James Moore. James qualified for states in the 200 medley relay, as well as the 100 backstroke. Alex Wang in the 200 medley relay. Jacob Hirschberg, Jacob qualified for the 200 medley relay, the 100 butterfly, and the 100 backstroke. Andrew Hartman, Andrew uh, qualified in the 200 medley relay and the 100 freestyle. And Ewan Izzard, who qualified for the 200 intermediate medley and the 100 backstroke. Congratulations. Congratulations, guys. We had two gymnasts coached by our head coach, Julie uh, Bouchard, assisted by Kendra Bouchard. I'd like to call up Kate Brown. Kate not only was a uh, all-around, the first ever Bethlehem gymnast to win the all-around, and Chloe Kosick, who qualified for states on the uneven bars. Congratulations. <laughs> We had, let's see, we had five, sorry, four young ladies qualify for states, including a sectional champion. Our head coach is Darnell Douglas, uh, assisted by Coach uh, Shrapowitzki, who's here tonight. Uh, Camella Douglas, Camella was the sectional champion in long jump as well as the state qualifier. Charlotte O'Meara in the 1,000 meter. Riley Davis in the 1,500 meter run. And Lindsey Farmer in the triple jump. Congratulations. <laughs> He's shy. <laughs> well, we were waiting for you. <laughs> okay. 
So I got to say, I, I, our, our ice hockey team, once again, Division One, Section Two, Section Champions, and, and I say once again, this is now the, the fourth sectional championship in the last five years where there's been a state tournament. Obviously, the year of COVID kind of uh, hijacked our season as our boys were prepared to go to Buffalo for the Frozen Four for the first time. This year's team had a record of 20 and four and just an incredible team that has really turned into a perennial state power. I'm so proud of this team coached by Dylan Lappy and Kevin Shannon. So gentlemen, when you hear your name, come on up. Jackson Adams. David Bevenu, who just snuck in. Tyler Bightley. Rory Carnes. Rory was the Section 2 Player of the Year, our goaltender, with seven shutouts. <laughs> Stellan Calerno Jackson. Will Clark. Tyler Fabian. Eamon Fitzpatrick. Owen Godlewski. Cade Jones. Dane Jones. Dane is a honorable mention All-State player. Steven Liebold. Zach Longton. Dylan McInerney. Finn McNamara. Cameron Moon. Zachary Novak, Sean Parker, Liam Perry, Theodore Plummer, Alex Shaw, Cam Smith, and Hugh Sullivan. Congratulations, guys. I do want to mention that Bethlehem has had the last five consecutive Section 2 Players of the Year. Congratulations. Thank you. Next up is the um, board report. Uh, first, I just wanted to extend my congratulations to the cast and crew and directors of Mamma Mia, um, which I had the chance to see over the weekend, and it was a great, um, a great show. Uh, second, I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that there is an art faculty art show happening at the library um, during the month of April, and I encourage everybody to stop by and check that out. And then lastly, um, just to, um, uh, in case the email didn't catch your eye, on April 26th, NISBA is doing a virtual policy workshop that is focused on um, free speech, 
with respect to district policies. So if anybody is interested um, in participating in that, reach out to Brittany and she can help set that up. Um, anybody else have anything they would like to add? I also attended the musical. I loved it. It was fabulous. We have a talented bunch of kids here and um, it was just an exciting show all the way around. I did have one question um, related to the um, budget vote in May. Do we post, I can't remember if we put it online, the um, bus proposition with like the comparison of what we had on the table in regards to the cost of regular buses versus electric buses because I'm getting some feedback from the community. They just want to have like an awareness to it if they don't watch the meetings to know what they're voting on. And I didn't know if that's something we put on our actual website. It would only be part of it, it would be included in the minutes from the board meetings, but it's not separate, like it's part of the bond proposition. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else have anything? All right. Next are our student reports. Do we have anybody from the high school student senate? We do. Hi. Hi, good evening. Um, recently in Student Senate, we've been planning our leg of the Eagle Challenge, which will be on Saturday from 12 to 4. And we've got a bunch of different people from the community to bring in vehicles like fire trucks, police cars, and even tractors. And we are encouraging students of all ages, especially some of the younger children from elementary schools, to come with their families to get to know these vehicles and learn more about them. And we would also encourage everyone to um, get their tickets online if they want to come to the event or for any section of it. And we would also like to congratulate our senators and peers in Mamma Mia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have anybody from the middle school here tonight? I don't think so. Okay. Um, next is our presentation this evening, and it, this is our 2023-2024 budget overview and discussion. Good evening, all. The days are getting longer. The birds are chirping. Our city is in bloom, which means we must be bringing this process at least to, to some sort of closure. So, or so we hope. Uh, this is sort of a, uh, an opportunity to sort of recap what we've discussed over the past several board meetings in terms of where the 23-24 budget stands, and we'll have some closeout items towards the end. This chart represents the comparison of expenditures and revenues over the course of the last several cycles. You may recall that when we started the budget process back in February, the initial gap between expenditures and revenues was roughly $720,000. And then through a subsequent meetings, we added certain costs, subtracted others for some net increases in the areas of transportation, technology, athletics, operations and maintenance, instructional program, some miscellaneous items, and some revised estimates, which we'll get to momentarily. Back on February 15th, the Transportation Department asked for an addition of a telematics specialist at a net, um, at a gross cost of $67,753. In technology, there were additions of a security operations center, additional costs associated with hardware and software updates. The addition of two new portals being Parent Square, which is a forward-facing portal uh, for parents into the Bethlehem District community. School Front, which is an internal portal for administrative staff. An addition of both a data web architect and a senior systems administrator. That's a one-year ad for each of those positions to provide the IT department with some time to cross-train for expected retirement sometime in the 23-24 school year. On the reduction side, School Messenger and Optigate, which um, are the two portals being replaced by Parent Square and School Front, yields a net increase of roughly $535,000. On the athletic side, Mr. Keyes had requested an uh, increase of roughly $4,200 for a modified football coach. 
$20,000 for travel expenses for various championships and roughly $5,000 in field rental costs while the capital project uh, sort of gets shovels in the ground and gets the uh, fields that the district customer earlier uses up to where they need to be. <clears throat> Operations and maintenance added a safety appropriation of roughly $15,000 to address pandemic response and equipment and supplies should there be issues from a health and safety perspective associated with any large scale um, <coughs> pandemic or uh, similar outbreak. On the instructional side, you'll see several additions and decreases. A lot of these actually net out between both the additions and uh, the decreases. Um, I'm gonna turn this over just quickly to, to Dr. Hurst because there were uh, one or two items that were added between the last time we met and this time. So under the additions, um, we inadvertently left off a stipend for the Odyssey of the Mind um, advisor. Um, so that is now included, um, just roughly $2,300. And then on the reduction side, we are now much further along in our scheduling process. Um, this is always a challenge because budget time is actually a little bit too early in terms of our scheduling process. We're never quite where we need to be, but we're far enough along now to recognize that um, our requests for art courses at the high school um, are dramatically down, drastically down. Um, so we'd be, we, we are able to reduce um, art by an additional 0.5 on top of the the Latin one, which I would mentioned last time, and then the PE and music. which is, So PE, music, and art are all driven, again, by um, reduction in requests in class sizes at the high school. They're also a function of, if you recall, last year we, we used to have two skills classes at Ellesmere um, and one at the middle school. Now we have one and one. We never adjusted for that in terms of FTE for specials. And then similarly, we went from 97 sections at the elementary level to 96, um, and we did not adjust that way either. We left ourselves a little bit of a buffer, um, and with that buffer that we currently have this year and the decrease in enrollment and the decrease in some requests, um, we're able to reduce these. Um, so currently the phys ed, we, we have a part-time teacher that would be impacted by that, which is a year-to-year -year appointment. Um, we have a part-time music teacher. Again, that's a year-to-year -year appointment. And then art, um, we actually have a teacher who requested to drop down to 0.5, so it ends up working out perfectly well that we don't have to actually reduce um, a full-time person. And then I know, Catherine, you had some additional questions as well. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, so I guess my questions are, you know, have to do with this, uh, with specials in general. So if I understood you correctly, the PE and the, we're letting go of the PE and the music teacher. Is that accurate? Correct. Okay. Um, and then, when we're reducing these, a lot of these positions, um, at least for music and art, and I, I don't know about PE, but you could you could tell me. I know they travel between mm -hmm. schools, and they travel and they work amongst all of the different educational levels uh, throughout the district. And so, I'm just wondering if we are um, shifting these positions this way, what impact is that going to have? On the other teachers, are we going to have to have people picking up more sections? No, well, so they can't contractually; they can't pick up more sections. Like every teacher is assigned a 1.0 FTE. So what that typically means is, if you're at the elementary level alone, you would do teach 30 sections a week, six per day. Um, if you travel, you only do 29. Uh, middle and high school are structured a little bit differently, so they teach five courses a day or 25 a week. Um, so we do have some travelers. We've always had some travelers. That's not the number of travelers is not increasing because the number of elementary sections is not changing, right? So the, the difference is really at the high school. Because of decreased enrollment, we're able to compress sections. Um, and we do have two fewer sections at the elementary level. Um, so it's basically just the, that point nine, which covered some elementary and some high school before, you know, another person is now gonna cover some elementary and then the high school likewise. So there's no, in terms of overall travel, it's no different than it's been Historically, are those who tra may I continue? Okay, go ahead. are those who travel going to have to? Because I, I hear what you're saying that we've had them. Are they going to have to travel more? Are we going to have no. teachers who are covering additional schools uh, because of this? No. Okay. Um, and what was my? Sorry. Um, and then are we? You know, one thing that just I want to try to 
wherever we can for our teachers is making sure that I know that especially for folks who are traveling there's a lot of gear shifting right where you're going from teaching fourth grade to teaching kindergarten to teaching you know what have you um, as you move through the day and through the week and from school to school and so I'm just wondering is can we do all we can to make sure that we are minimizing that gear shifting if that makes sense as, yeah we do i mean it's, it's tricky teachers. because don't forget so at the elementary level you've essentially got four specials that you have to account for um, you've got uh, music art pe and library right so to try to say that the art teacher is going to teach first grade first grade first grade then second grade it's it's next to impossible to accomplish we try to keep them together as best we can so that you're not constantly swapping out materials so typically like with art you'll try to keep the primary levels together and the intermediate levels together, but it's not a perfect science. Um, there's just, I mean, with the constraints of the schedule, there's no way to do that when you have four specials in any given day. One of the, um, uh, I think what you're also asking about, we, when possible, if teachers do travel, we try to keep them in one building all day, right. rather than split, we right. have to move during the day. Thank it's you. not always possible, but when we can, we actually, this year we had very few that had to travel on a certain day right. um, related services sometimes do just because there's so different but we try not to do that when possible thank you for yep. reading between the lines there as well thank you christine i had a question on the art um, decrease of the 0.5 so what does that equate to about 100 a little more than 100 students didn't so select we have well we have so we have basically five classes that did not have enough mm -hmm. students to run. They're, point, they're all point one courses, um, and all of them had requests under 10. So did they end up selecting? So like most, yeah, they would collapse into other sections. So instead of a section only having 17, they might have 18 or 19. Some decided to do other electives. Okay. Um, but we, and we've talked sure. about this before. We're, we're sort of a um, victim of our own success. We have so many elective offerings um, that students, have, they have way more choice than they've ever had, and it's just spreading. You know, our enrollment's way down compared, right? We went from a graduating class of 400 not too long ago down to almost 300 now. So that's, you know, 400 fewer students overall in the high school. We have more electives. So there's fewer kids to be spread over more, more electives, which, so one of the things we are looking at is to have more of a sort of a cyclical rotation where, you know, this elective is only going to run every other year and then another one's going to kind so that you, students can kind of plan ahead. Okay, if I want to take these electives, this one I'm going to have to do junior year, this one I'm going to have to do senior year, and then they're not competing against one another. So that's something we're working on is trying to come up with a cycle of electives so that they're not competing against one another and then nothing runs, right? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure with the art sections that they weren't just collapsing into others and getting up to like 25 to 28 no, for an art class because that's a lot for a teacher to give individual attention. Yeah, I mean the art classes are still harboring in the 15 to 18 range. Thank you. So in terms of additions of the instructional program, there was roughly $316,000 in uh, increases that were offset by roughly $266,000 in reductions, yielding a net increase um, compared to baseline budget on the instructional side of the ledger by $49,000. Some miscellaneous items that were included uh, and discussed at previous board meetings, roughly $28,000 associated with the Yonder program, $22,000 for vision screening for ele elementary schools, uh, specifically as it relates to the tip machines. Those are the sort of binocular style uh, pieces of equipment that students uh, use to gauge vision, <clears throat> and roughly $50,000 for communications uh, specifically videography services. <clears throat> this represents a side-by-side -side of the, uh, the budget process based on uh, category of expenditures. So you start off with 22-23 just to serve as a reference as the budget cycle that we're presently in at roughly $102.7 million. When we first presented this budget back in February, the estimated expenditure uh, level was roughly $105.9 million, and as a result of some additions and reductions over the course of the past several weeks, 
the adjusted budget as it stands as of today is $106.7 million, broken up in the, the categories that you see there. The year-to-year -year increase between 22-23 to 23-24 is just a tad under $4 million, or roughly 3.9% on the expenditure side. Similar slide, just broken out in the various categories um, in terms of organizational unit and program area. This is a slide I, I had put up when we first met back in February, and I, I sort of resurrected it because I, I thought it sort of tells a, a particularly interesting story and challenge in terms of the district. The, you, you may recall that under the New York State property tax cap law, school districts are allowed to increase their tax levies by, by an inflationary factor of 2%. And that's represented by the black line. The red factor, I'm sorry, that's represented by the red line. The black line actually represents what the year-to-year -year inflationary growth is. And for most years, prior to 2021, you'll see that the black line and the, the orange or red line sort of mirror each other. There's a couple of dips and valleys on that. But beginning in 2021, inflation is increasing at a greater and much market rate compared to what the property tax cap law provides. In 2022, the inflation factor was 4.7%, and for our 23-24 school year, it's roughly 8%. And when you compare that to the 2% inflation factor allowed under the tax cap law, that golden area that shaded is inflationary growth and pressure that the district has to absorb through other measures. So that, impacts operational needs, it impacts service delivery, it impacts the district's ability to plan and implement strategic initiatives, and really to manage that gap, there's a lot of thought that goes into in terms of both resource management and strategic planning to remain sort of um, that we can close that gap. So this growth factor here, 4.7%, 8%, this is what we were allowed under the property tax cap and if you recall from the prior slide, we were uh, able to maintain growth in expenditures by roughly 3.9%. Jumping to the revenue side of the ledger, this is a side-by-side -side comparison between the year that we're currently in and what is currently uh, in front of you today in terms of revenue. The school district revenue is really tied to three main pieces of um, revenue streams, one of which being school taxes, state aid, and pilot payments. And those are sort of broken out um, on the graph here. There are some other miscellaneous revenue streams at roughly $1.7 million, but those are relatively small in comparison. You'll see that the total for 23-24 are roughly $106.7 million, balances out the expenditure total that was referenced in an earlier slide. <clears throat> So under the property tax cap law, districts are allowed to increase their tax levy by a certain amount. There's a complicated formula that we discussed uh, back on February 15th, but the first line of this chart shows what the district's maximum, tax, maximum allowable tax levy is. And I, what, what I was, wanted the board to, to be able to visualize here is what that maximum allowable tax levy was, what the actual tax levy levied and adopted by the board and ultimately approved by the public was, what the, and what the difference was between those two figures. So in 21-22, you could see that the maximum allowable tax levy was roughly $69.8 million. We levied $69.2 million. That's a year-to-year -year increase of $515,000. The allowable tax levy increase was 1.61%, but the actual tax levy increase was three quarters of 1%. That means that the district actually did not tax $588,000. That's not to say that we would, but that's the difference between what the actual tax levy was and what the maximum allowable tax levy was under the property tax cap law. 
22-23, same sort of analysis. The district did not levy 102, almost $103,000 in taxes that it could have under the property tax cap law. In 23-24, which is the year we're going into, the maximum allowable tax levy was $71,368,000. The proposal in front of you assumes a tax levy of roughly $70.8 million. That's a year-to-year -year increase of $1,591,000. The district under New York State would, was permitted to increase taxes by 3.08%, but what is in front of you presently is a tax levy increase of 2.3%, which equates to roughly $543,000 in unlevied taxes that could have been levied under the property tax cap law. Over the course of those three years in particular, um, residents and businesses within the community did not have roughly $1.2 million in taxes levied that could have been levied under the tax cap law. <clears throat> this slide is a side-by-side -side comparison between what the maximum allowable tax levy could have been over the past six fiscal years compared to what the actual tax levy is or what is is proposed to be. Over the course of the past six fiscal years, roughly $8.2 million in cumulative savings uh, were turned back to um, taxpayers, and it sort of represents the fiscal stewardship to the district to minimize the impact of real property taxpayers. This gap here is really the year-to-year -year savings from one year to the next for, for residents and businesses. This is a side-by-side uh, -side comparison of state aid, that is, outside of property taxes, the second largest source of revenue for the district. We, uh, the district experienced a large increase in foundation aid from $15.4 million to roughly $18.2 million. 18 .2 million. Uh, 23 represents the final phase-in of foundation aid for the district. Uh, there's some other categories between BOCES and special ed, transportation, and building aid. Um, I wanted to highlight the high impact tutoring set aside of $275,000. That amount is presently from the state level built into the foundation aid total. However, the state has required that to be almost carved out and set aside uh, specifically for that, uh, that program. There's been a lot of back and forth in terms of both the Assembly and the Senate in terms of whether it should remain a carve out, whether it should be used for some alternative purpose, or whether or not they'll make that available uh, as it was originally intended as part of foundation aid. I don't have any more information on that. Um, the leg uh, state legislature is in break until sometime later this month. I'll keep the board um, as well as the superintendent's office apprised of any changes. But in the end, over some point in time, either later this year or 23-24, that $275,000 may be made available um, in state aid to offset expenditures. This is a side-by-side -side comparison of the district's um, fiscal planning in terms of fund balance and reserves based on reserve type. Presently, there is roughly $40.8 million uh, slated in, uh, to be available in reserves um, as of forecasting for June of 2023, and they're broken out by category. As a reminder, under state law, um, districts are allowed only to keep no more than 4% of its operating budget in fund balance which is, depending on your year, it grows uh, or contracts based on the size of the operating budget, but presently it's forecasting to be roughly around $4.3 million. This is a uh, updated status of the capital reserves the district maintains as of April 5th. We have three um, capital reserves associated with capital-related projects. 2015, 2019, and 2022. It shows what was originally authorized by the board um, as well as the, as the public, what is presently available, what is committed, 
and what we estimate the balance to be at the, uh, the end of the year. So in 2015, we presently have $5.1 million available. Uh, five point, the entirety of that 5.1 is committed to offset the uh, upcoming capital project, as well as $8.3 million from the 2019 reserve for a total of roughly $13.4 million in reserve funding, which decreased the district's need to actually go out to um, finance the remainder of the project through, through bonds. Last year, um, the board and public authorized the creation of the 2022 capital reserve with a limit of $20 million. $6.2 million is presently available in that reserve as of today. We have roughly $7.9 million estimated to remain as of the end of our 22-23 um, fiscal year. I mentioned briefly earlier that under Section 13, 1318 of Real Property Tax Law, uh, districts are um, allowed to only keep 4% of their fund balance, 4% uh, of their operating budget in fund balance. Um, so for, as of June 30th, 2022, this is, can be found on the district's annual um, financial document. Voter approved roughly $102.7 million in operating budget. That 4% maximum threshold resulted in $4.1 million of available fund balance. There was $243,000 on assigned fund balance associated with encumbrances, leaving a total assigned fund balance of $4.3 million. At the close out of our 22-23 fiscal year, there was an audit adjustment of roughly $222,000, uh, which put us over uh, by that, that amount. So it's technically a, we're over by that 4%, but it was associated with, a, with an audit adjustment. It wasn't uh, particularly planned. We spent a lot of time over the, the course several, uh, over the course of the past several meetings highlighting pilot payments, the importance of that revenue stream to the district, and what pilot payments look like over the, the next couple of fiscal years. You may recall that roughly $3.8 million uh, in pilots is budgeted for our 23-24 fiscal year, but of that $3.8 million, $3.4 million is associated with the PSEG pilot, which is 23-24 uh, is the last year of that pilot, which means we're going, we anticipate pilot revenue for 24-25 to be only $400,000. When you uh, compare that to what the estimated tax cap calculation of the property tax cap law could be, in 22-23, you could see it was 0.15%. 23-24, it was 3.08%, but we're only uh, proposing a tax increase of 2.3%. But because of the drop-off in pilots, mathematically, under the property tax cap law, taxes could increase by roughly 9%. There's an appreciation by the business office that is um, impractical, but mathematically I wanted to, to sort of highlight and showcase what that does from a matter of arithmetic um, based on such a significant loss in pilot revenue. Part of the business office's charge is to present to the folks here a um, rough projection, multi-year projection of revenues and expenses over the next four fiscal years. Now, projections are, are hard, they're necessary, of course, but you, you start making assumptions on your cost centers and your revenue streams, and towards the tail end of your projections, they, they get a little bit wonky only because there's so many unknowns uh, that impact the district. But this is the business office's best guess as of right now in terms of how revenues will shake out as well as uh, expenditures over the next uh, three or four fiscal years. In order to balance the, the budget between revenues and expenses, there is some use of fund balance for 24, uh, 25, and the, the two subsequent years. That also assumes that through careful and prudent management of the budget throughout that year, whatever fund balance we'll be using to balance one year, we will also be subsequently replenishing towards the end of the closeout so additional fund balance is available to minimize tax increases. Some assumptions in terms of revenue um, does assume a 2% increase in school taxes as um, 
which is the threshold under the property tax cap law. State aid increases of 2%. I can't speak in terms of the way the state finances are uh, going to shake out, so we will certainly keep an eye on that. Uh, the other revenue streams are roughly um, assumed to, to be the same. We made some prudent estimates in terms of COLA adjustments and fringe benefits as well as contractual costs to show that through careful management of resources, planning, conversations with both the community and the board, we'll be able to maintain a balanced budget for the next three fiscal years. Just a, a quick refresher on the capital outlay. Um, the Nick and Sonia, our director of facilities, had spent some time um, articulating that the crisis leadership preparedness solutions um, firm had come in, sort of done an audit of the district's facilities, provided some recommendations. And the district can expend up to $100,000 in capital costs associated with building infrastructure. And the recommendation by the director of facilities is to um, add a, an additional layer of functionality to the district's uh, Aviglon um, security feature. So what this would do would install sensors beginning at the high school on all the exterior doors that would alert administration um, if doors are left ajar, advertently, inadvertently, they are programmable. And um, should you want them to be ajar, that it wouldn't necessarily provide a, an alert uh, you can set it for you know weekends or um, after hours if there's going to be events. But the the real purpose here is to to make sure that uh, there's not a door chalk that's left over uh, into the door so so someone could get in. So we anticipate that the cost of that uh, project will will fall in with the one hundred thousand dollars threshold. Um, still requires SED approval, um, but it's a little bit of an easier process that can be incorporated into the district's operating budget. Ballot propositions, the district is proposing um, for public review and vote one proposition for a bus purchase. Um, at the last meeting, the board approved a resolution in the legal ad for uh, the following bus proposition. The addition of one 70 passenger electric bus at a estimated cost of $404,000 and two eight passenger four by four Suburbans at uh, an estimated cost of 128,000, bringing the total bus proposition um, estimated cost at $533,000. This is the, the formalized language of the bus proposition. I will note that the actual dollar amount in the bus proposition language is roughly $35,000 higher than the slide previously. That was intentional only to provide um, some flexibility with what we're experiencing on the supply chain um, side of the equation. It's only there for contingency purposes only. Should something run a little bit hotter or, you know, delivery charges or what have you, um, but this will provide the district with the opportunity to spend up to $568,720 should the voting public approve that amount um, on um, an electric bus and two eight-passenger uh, Suburbans. As a reminder, there are three um, Board of Education seats open um, for a three-year term expiring June 30th, 2026. Uh, nominating petitions were first made available on February 15th and are due back to the District Clerk, Brittany Barrett, by Monday, April 17th at 5 p.m. The seats that are presently open are currently occupied by Christine Beck, Holly Dellenbaugh and Meredith Moriarty. And for the final slide of the night, just sort of a, a, a brief update of where, what meetings are still uh, scheduled associated with the, the budget and election process. On May 3rd, there's a public hearing on the proposed budget. On May 10th is the Meet the Candidates night. And on May 16th, ultimately the budget uh, vote from 7 a.m to 9 p.m. Uh, at the Bethlehem Central High School. You're done. Oh. <laughs> I'm good for 
I'm questions? Just, I'm just double checking. Yeah. <laughs> I can Thank talk you. more if you like. Thank you. Um, Bob, you have a question? Yeah. John, I, I'll bring you all the way back to uh, slide six, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, and I apologize. This, this will probably be pretty, pretty quick. But I just the um, uh, the data web architect and the senior system as administrator. Yes. Are the, are those permanent or they're, they're one year term? They are. They are not permanent in terms of the additions. They are being added to provide a um, a mentoring learning opportunity as we transition to existing employees who we anticipate that are. Uh, retiring sometime over 23, 24. So next year, all else being equal, those two positions would net out. And then, um, I'm sorry, is, is it on that? So Do you mind if I ask on no, that slide? Is not. that all right? So while we're still here, and John, this may not, this may be a question. I don't think this is in your shop. So if we want to come back later, that's totally fine. Any sense if Parent Square is going to work with the bus transportation? <laughs> So I don't, I don't have an update <laughs> on that other <laughs> than that we had reached out to, to both vendors and both vendors seemed willing to see if they could work together to incorporate the functionality between the two. I don't have any more update than that, but we took that as actually a positive sign that, that they, were, they were open for it. Thank you. Thank you, John, for having me jump in there. Bob, do you have another question? I do, and this is just sort of a background uh, for myself. On, on slide 22, there's a sort of a notation on the bottom about, uh, you know, it's almost like a wish if districts could maintain more yep. than 4% or the rainy day um, uh, fund or balance uh, program. Uh, my understanding from the, the tone of that is that that's not currently available under New York state laws? That's so. under real property tax law, that's correct. On the county side, I can speak from experience, there isn't a, there's not a hard limit under or lower. The Office of the State Comptroller does look at things a little bit, you know, from, from the lens of you don't have enough to, to meet unforeseen expenditures or revenue losses, or you have too much, which means you know, if, if you're looking at a, a, an undesignated fund balance of 25, 30, 35 percent, you really should be using that to offset um, or minimize costs incurred by the taxpayer. So from the county, village, municipal side, you actually have a little bit more flexibility in terms of what you could keep on your books in terms of undesignated fund balance. From the district, from a school district side, four uh, percent, I appreciate why it's in there in terms of, uh, again, to maintain um, fiscal stu stewardship and minimize impact, but it's a really low number in terms of what that raw cost is, especially when you see some of the fluctuations that um, may be outside the school district's um, direct control. If there's a shortfall at state aid, for like example, of $4 million, dollars, that, mm -hmm. you know, on a base of 30, that doesn't look so bad, but it does from what is available in terms of fund balance. And fund balance is actually used by the street in terms of what bond rating you may get. Like, are, are you doing enough to make sure that you are planning ahead to have fiscal resources and some fuel left in the tank to meet those um, unforeseen expenditures or revenue losses? It is something that I know NISPA has been advocating right, that, that was to, question, right? um, yeah. to make that change. It just hasn't. Nothing has happened. Right. And so has um, state school superintendents, association, business officials, or at the very least, maybe to consider looking at an average over a period of years. So mm -hmm. when you have a situation like this, you could take a couple years prior to plan accordingly so you're not looking at those wide fluctuations. And right, sort of spread it out. Yeah, yeah. but they, it's not, I think it's just hasn't been a priority. Okay, thank you, yeah. thank you, John. Catherine, did you have another question? Yeah, I did. I just was wondering, um, <clears throat> I know legal ads and requirements for placing legal ads are very precise. Is that the reason that we don't indicate the net cost of the buses? Because wouldn't those be the more relevant costs in the end rather than the gross? <laughs> we'll follow up later. <laughs> I don't recall which slide that is. I'm sorry. It would be this for the, the, this, the, the, the proposition this one? language. Uh, the one previous one, one before this. There we are. 
You have to put the total amount. You that can't. You, you can't to offset. Spend. But you can't it's offset it by the state aid. Yeah. Christine, on the same question. note, though, I understand where you're going with you want the real cost to be shown to the community. Right. And that's where I kind of was going before earlier that I think we should be very transparent as to costs. And on the website, we should list out exactly what you're saying, the actual cost of the bus after we get our aid. But I also think we should be transparent due to the cost of the electric buses what one bus costs is versus three diesel buses, and I want to make clear I'm environmentally conscious, we're paying $100,000 more for a bus, and there's still some concerns with like environmental concerns, like how dis to dispose the batteries. So there are some opposite um, issues. Even though we're doing it to be more environmentally friendly, there's still some concerns environmentally with having electric buses because they don't know what they're going to do as the buses and the electric um, vehicles increase. So I just wanted to say if there's any way for us to put on the website for our community to know this was what's on the proposition, this was what, so they're informed voters when they go to the polls. So I would like to suggest that. Um, and second, I was looking at your 25, 26, 26, 27, and 24, 25. So 107, I think you had 110, 113. So you're looking at like an increase of two to three million yep. a year, which is usual for salaries, fringe mm -hmm. benefits to increase year over year. Are we taking into consideration, and I think this is another real issue, is salaries for teachers and how in the market are we still going to be competitive? And how is that going to play into the b budget when the pilot's dropping off? And I didn't see that built into the subsequent years, so I actually think the deficit could be detrimentally higher. And so I just want to be conservative in our sure. this budget and going forward. Like when I talk about, you know, should we be adding a telematics specialist? It's not because I don't want to add a telematics specialist to the districts. It's like, okay, we're adding this person, but in two years, are we going to have to cut? And that's a real possibility with a $4 million deficit and a wage crisis that might affect teachers already having a shortage. So I just, I just wanted to bring awareness to that. I think the budget cycle this year was very reasonable, but I just think going forward, we really have to, like every little dime that we put on the board, we have to scrutinize it because we're not gonna be in this position for very long. If I just, if I may, just quickly, if you look at the the budget process from from a hundred percent perspective, my my philosophy has always been it's really about ten percent in terms of budget development, it's about ninety percent on budget management. Mm -hmm. um, well, beginning July first, you're off to the races trying to make sure that whatever expenditure is being made is is absolutely essential and necessary. Are you maximizing every revenue dollar that's coming in? Sometimes it's it's a, a simple uh, formula issue in terms of how you're putting things on a reimbursement form that you can actually maximize a little bit more. Um, in terms of the, um, the the projections, I alluded to this a little bit. So much of this is unknown, right? This, this is why we're con in the business office constantly taking the temperature of where where we were, where we're at, where we thought we would be, and where we're going. So uh, we, we did make some um, judicious estimates in terms of cost of living adjustments. There is a lot unknown in terms of where enrollment may be. We don't know, um, I think uh, Dr. Hurst had highlighted at some point in terms of where the instructional personnel is in terms of um, those uh, teachers and support staff that are eligible for, for retirement. There's gonna be some delta as you yep. lose instructional knowledge, uh, I'm sorry, institutional knowledge, bringing in new folks. So, so there's, there's gonna be some breakage there that'll offset or decrease your out-of-pocket costs year to year. Uh, we're constantly looking at opportunities to, to manage our fringe benefit load. That gets a little bit more challenging only because so much of that is literally outside the district's control. Whether it's state, um, state retirement, we only have so much flexibility in terms of controlling hospital and medical costs. Um, there is some assumptions built into that as well. Um, I will say in 26, 27, it, it does jump up a little bit only because the 
board has to determine what the vehicle replacement plan for the for the buses are. So given some of the discussions we had earlier, outside of the one proposition that's in front of the board now, there is the assumption that in 26, 27 is the year that the band payment for the larger bus acquisition hits. So there's some flexibility there as well, right? So in some ways we tried to make this not so much a worst case scenario, but more on the let's be as conservative as we can so you folks have aren't blindsided two, three years from now or next month even in terms of wait a second. We, we didn't even anticipate that this was coming. So uh, my goal and role here is to provide as many updates as you're willing to listen to me uh, provide you as well as answer any questions that you may have. Hey, where are we at? What are some of the pinch points? What are some of the strategies? And uh, we can go from there. Well, so as you were asking, I just pulled the numbers up. Um, so we currently have um, 71 teachers that are 55 or older. And we have another 73 that are between 50 and 54. So within the next five years, we could have as much as 35% of our teachers wow. retire. So retire. just to give you some perspective. But Not saying they all will, but. I can't anticipate there probably will be some contractual changes based on the current environment. Oh, no, 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 for sure. But we so, have substantial breakage probably in the yeah. next three to five years. That's a lot. It that raises a whole other concern. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, <laughs> I'm glad I brought this up. <laughs> Thank you. John. John, I want to confirm for the telematics specialist, the, one of the criteria is that they'll have to have a CDL, That's correct? That's correct. Okay. As a requirement for all transportation drivers from dispatch to supervisors to mechanics to the director of um, transportation, the only ones that, are, that do not have that requirement are the bus attendants. Thank you. Mary, did you have a question? Uh, yeah. I I had a question regarding this slide and the use of the fund balance. Um, I see we've got 2.6 million um, next year, 3.1, 4.3. But I thought you also said when you were explaining it that would, we would also be adding to the fund balance. That's so right. I'm not quite sure how that works, that we're, we're taking mm -hmm. money from the fund balance but also adding it. Right. So. For sake of argument, let's say for 24-25, uh, we're going to use $2.6 million to balance the budget when we first present the budget in February of 20, uh, 2024. Sorry, mm -hmm. my years are getting a little um, mixed up here. We will anticipate through management that when we close out the prior fiscal year, there's going to be additional funding between either increased revenue streams or under expenditures that will go and replenish the, re replenish the 2.6. Okay. So my recommendation is not necessarily to look at your fund balance use in one year, but sort of look at your change in fund balance over the year you're going into versus where you also, where you think fund balance will be in the year you're in. And the goal is obviously to not have to use fund balance, right. but I think in the next few years, we probably will have to dip into that where we haven't had to in the last few years. And you're comfortable with even the 4.3 million going out? If you're asking the budget guy whether or not he's comfortable using fund balance. The question to that is, the answer to that question is always no. Okay. Um, but uh, again, you, what you don't want to show is that you're unable to balance your budget. Mm -hmm. This shows that we can, it's uncomfortable given the parameters at play here, but it's also four years out. Mm -hmm. So I'll have a better sense of where these next three years stack up at the end of you know, July, August, when we get our financial report back, where we're revenues over expenditures, maybe we're adding more money to reserves that we can use to offset other expenditures, which would not require the use of fund balance. We'll keep you apprised of, you know, the retirements or changes, um, any vacancies that remain um, unfilled. Although, you, know, I, I, you you budget based on what the anticipated need is. But for example, in transportation, you know that we've had some some trouble filling uh, bus drivers and bus attendants. We're budgeted for the number of routes uh, for uh, the number of bus drivers and attendants needed for those routes. If we have difficulty filling, that's going to be um, 
appropriation values that flow back into the fund balance or reserves to offset unanticipated costs moving forward. Any other questions? Um, I just wanted to say uh, thank you to, well, all of our department areas, but particularly, John, to you for putting together all of the budget presentations um, this cycle. I know it's a, it is a lot of work, um, and um, I just wanted to say thank you for doing that for us. Um, next is our recognition of public comment on an agenda item. Um, at this time, if we have any visitors with us who would like to address the board on an agenda item, please come to the microphone. Item six, action items. It is recommend A. Uh, a is the 2023-2024 budget adoption. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education discuss and approve the following finance action items one and two. So moved. Second. Um, so if we want to have any discussion at this point um, about the, before we vote to adopt the recommended uh, budget for the next fiscal year, um, now would be the time. I don't know if anyone would like to comment on their thoughts about where we are. Can we kind of go around or anyone has anything to say? I would comment, I mean, I think that the, I think it is um, the budget that was prepared for the board and put together um, seems to be well considered um, and, um, and I think it makes sense to move forward with it at this point. Yeah, I mean, it, it's been very w well presented as well, and, you know, so it's sort of sequential in the last X amount of meetings. So I'll, I'll add my, my thanks to, to John and all the rest of the folks who have really broken it down and, you know, made the process very transparent. Um, and so, you know, thank you for that. Any other comments? It was a very conservative budget and appreciated the thoughtfulness that, that went in presenting it. So thank you. <coughs> Um, there's no other discussion or comments. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. B, finance action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following finance action items one through three. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. C, professional personnel action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following professional personnel action items, one through 10. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. D, support personnel action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following support staff action items one through 13. So moved. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. E, other action items. It is recommended by the superintendent that the Board of Education approve the following action items one through four. So moved. Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That carries. Item seven, recognition of public comment on a non-agenda item. If we have any visitors who would like to address the board on a non-agenda item, now would be the time to come to the microphone. Item eight, future meetings and events. Um, our next uh, regular board meeting will be on April 19th, uh, 2023, um, after the, the school break. Um, that will be at Slingerlands Elementary School. So um, everybody can make a note of that. Um, and we'll try to send out a reminder um, that week that we will be at Slingerlands, not at the high school. Um, 
and anticipating executive session at 6 um, and then the regular board meeting at 7. On um, April 24th, uh, we have a policy committee meeting um, here at the high school. And then on May 3rd, um, that is our, uh, our next regular board meeting after that, and that's back here at the high school um, and anticipating executive session at 6 and reconvening at 7. Um, seeing no need to go back into executive session, could I have a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Meeting adjourned. Um, and our pig friends, if you guys want to come up and make sure you sign out.